Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? The uh, presence of God is here this morning. Gotta, gotta love that worship. And it, it's such an act of surrender. It's so actually invigorating to me. And it's exciting, as Pastor said, um, my wife and I used to lead the youth group for about five years here. And the whole role of up here were people who either were in youth group or still in youth group or just getting out of youth group. And it's awesome to see folks using the gifts that God has given them to glorify him. So praise God. That was exciting to see. Um, I was just chatting with Arnold in the back, and you know, I just wanted to follow up on what he said before. I know we were talking a little bit about Haiti, but he just made me aware that you know, there's actually rioting going on right now in Haiti, and they're actually calling for the president to step down. So um, keep Haiti in, in your prayers for sure, but just want to show that God still speaks to us today because we know another group that went to Haiti a week ago, and they were able to get in and out and no problem. So in the flesh, you're like, hey, they were able to get in, why can't we? So push on, but you know, I'm proud and I'm excited that we have a church family that prays and seeks and looks to hear from God and is not going out in their own flesh. So good call, but remember to keep Haiti in, in your prayers. And you know what, let's just pray right now for Haiti. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just lift up Haiti and what's going on down there right now, Lord. It's a nation in much need, Lord. Lord, and you have the cattle on a thousand hill. And we just pray, almighty God, Lord, that what the enemy meant for evil, you will turn around for good, Lord. We pray that through what's going on down there, Lord, that you would be glorified, that many would come to know you and to love you and to serve you. And your presence and your spirit would be, would be felt there. And it would be a changed nation on fire for you. And we pray your hedge of protection for all those down there. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as Pastor said, I am Kip Anderson. I believe it's up behind me in red, so thank you, Ozzy, for doing that. Uh, we've been coming to the Cornerstone for about 18 years now. Uh, during that time, we've served in a, a few different capacities. I was on the board of Deacon for a while. As I said, Shiloh and I recently uh, were leading the youth and currently in a season of rest, seeking the Lord and where God would have us serve next. But um, it's exciting to be here and share with you this morning. Pastor and I were having coffee. And if you know Pastor or if you know me, we both love coffee, big fan of it. Um, we were at Starbucks and we were just kind of chatting and, you know, I've known Pastor since he's gotten here, uh, talking about, you know, what's next. And he said, you know what, I'm going to be on vacation for a little bit. Would you be open to sharing and bringing the word forth in July? And I said, absolutely, Pastor. I never want to turn away from the opportunity to give God the glory and to glorify him and share the word that he's put on my heart. But uh, it's an exciting time in sports. Not only right now with the game that kicked off at 11 o'clock, but the past few weeks with the World Cup. There's been a lot of excitement, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of upsets. Again, I apologize in the first two service for my Colombian friends that come here to Cornerstone, but um, I'll be praying for you. I know it's a difficult time, but uh, this too shall pass, and we have four years from now. But no South American teams have made it to the semis in the World Cup. We have Belgium in place third, and right now France and Croatia are playing, so I'm guessing nobody here today is from France or Croatia because you, you know, missing the game. But I won't spoil it on you. I won't tell you. I hope you have a DVR and you can watch it tonight when you get home for after service about seven o'clock when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sports guy. I love sports. I grew up playing sports. I coach sports. I watch sports. Um, all around, just love sports. Thank God for it in the first couple services. I thank God for ibuprofen and ice because my body is not what it once was. I am 44 years old. I am not 18 any longer. I still try to play like I am, but thank God that God heals. There's an old saying by Bear Bryant. He says, defense wins championships. It's famous. It's been around sports. If you follow football, um, very well known saying. I'm not going to debate that. We would be here for a week because everybody has their own opinion on that. But what I will debate, that is if you have defense and you don't have any offense, it's pretty hard to win. Because what wins is points. And usually, points are scored on offense. The best you can do is hold for a tie. So without any offense, it is pretty hard to win. For those of you who don't know me, some of you do, but I don't like to lose. I personally like to win. It's just how I'm wired. And I would argue that most of us in this room prefer winning when we play a game. As I said, I coach a lot of sports, and I always tell the boys, I said, listen, if you're going to play, you might as well play to win. 
Go out there, leave everything you got on the field. Win or lose, but play to win. Winning typically is more fun. It's more exciting. Everybody's high-fiving, everybody's pumped up. But it's a lot more work as well. To win consistently, you need to sacrifice things. You need to make decisions. You need to be intentional in your choices. Are you going to practice? Are you going to get up off the couch and stop playing Fortnite and go in the driveway and shoot some hoops? I might be speaking from experience at what goes on in my family room till about 11 o'clock at night. Or should you put down Snapchat and actually go study for a test? And I'm going to incriminate myself here. About a month ago, I needed to stop watching reruns of Columbo. It's an awesome show if you haven't watched it. They just don't make it like they used to. Stop watching reruns of Columbo and work on my message. We get pulled in a lot of different directions. I know that I'm talking about sports, but there's a strong parallel between sports and our Christian life. Before I jump into the message this morning, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, that we can come into your house and serve you and worship you and be met with your presence. Lord, we pray that you'd be glorified here today. We pray that everything that we do would be uplifting to you. And we just pray that your presence and spirit would be felt. In Jesus' name, amen. So I like the quote by Bill Walsh. Some of you may know who Bill Walsh is. He's a Hall of Fame coach, used to coach for the San Francisco 49ers. He says, before you win the fight, you have to be in the fight. I'm going to say that again because that's important. Before you win the fight, you have to be in the fight. How many of us know sometimes life can be a fight? Since we're in this fight, let's play it to win. I've said it before, and I see some of the youth here. Life isn't always rainbows and puppies. It's not always sprinkles and ice cream. There are real struggles and there are real problems that we face every single day. We may live in an imperfect world, but church, I want to remind you this morning, we serve a perfect God. What you're going through today isn't a surprise. God didn't wake up one morning and be like, Kip, I didn't see that one coming. Whew, man, that one really knocked me off my chair. I didn't see it coming. Nothing is a surprise to him. It might be a surprise to us, but not to God. God sees the beginning from the end. His ways are higher than our ways. And that's why where I want to start with my first point. First of 37. So my point is, your perspective is important. Church, your perspective is important. I want to challenge you this morning. Check your perspective. Get your perspective right. Are you looking through the lens of fear and doubt? Or are you looking through the lens of faith and victory? It's important. That's a big decision. We all know the story of David and Goliath. Goliath, giant Philistine. Huge. Everybody was scared of him. And I've read this before and I've heard others use it, but it sits so well on the perspective on what we have. When the Israelite soldiers saw Goliath, they looked at him and said, he is so big. How could we kill him? David, a little shepherd boy, looked at Goliath and said, he is so big, how could I miss him? It's all about your perspective. In church, we're walking through life with different lenses. It's important to walk with a victory perspective. And why was David's perspective so strong? Why was he so positive? Because he practiced. He's fought others before. Not people, bears, lions. And he knew God was with him. He wasn't in the fight alone. He knew whose strength he was fighting Goliath. He was a shepherd. He kept them safe, the sheep safe. Different opponent, same perspective. David had a victory perspective, not a defeated perspective. And if you focus on the world and if you focus on the news and everything around you, it's easy to get down. But I want to encourage you, walk in a victory perspective. Before David went into battle against Goliath, King Saul approached David and said, David, you're a shepherd. I'm paraphrasing a little here. He said, you don't have your own battle armor. Why don't you wear mine? So if we look at 1 Samuel 17, starting in the second half of verse 39, David says, I cannot go in these, 
he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. He couldn't wear Saul's clothes. He couldn't wear his battle armor because it wasn't what he was used to. It wasn't what he practiced in. It wasn't what he fought with before. What are you fighting with? Are you fighting with weapons of this world? Or are you fighting in the spirit? Are you fighting with the word of God? What strength are you walking in? David fought how he knew, in the armor that he knew, which was his normal clothes, with what he knew, and most importantly, in the power of who, excuse me, of who he knew. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. We know how this ends. David is victorious. He beats Goliath. It's important to remember, it's not now who or what we fight, it's in whose strength we fight in. Too many times we try to fight it in our own strength. Perspective can also cause worry. It also could rob you of time. So I'm going to share a story. It happened last weekend. We were up in Vermont. For those of you who know my wife, Shyla, she's over here. She is a bit more adventurous than I am. She has no problem jumping out of planes, scuba diving with sharks, all types of crazy stuff. For me, it scares me. But I do it. Not that stuff. I won't do that. But my kids take after Shyla. They'll zip line. They'll jump out of trees. They'll jump off cliffs. They'll do whatever. I'm a bit more cautious. So we're up in Vermont, and Shyla's like, wouldn't it be fun if we went zip lining? And my initial response was, no. <laughs> But the kids were into it. So they're like, yeah, let's go zip lining, Daddy. So I said, all right, we're going to zip. I've done the aerial adventure parks. I've done all that stuff before. It's not too bad. OK. This is a little bit different. We were zip lining, so we go to the top of a ski mountain. We take the chairlift up, up. We keep going. I'm like, all right, how do I fake an injury? How do I get out of this? How do I go hide in the bathroom? So we're going to the top. And this has been something that's on my mind. I've been thinking about it, not really wanting to do it. But I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it. The family wants to do it. So we get to the top. We're like, all right. It's high, but it's not that high. Oh, no. We had to climb another seven stories to get to the top of where we're going to go. And oh, by the way, it wasn't that long. It was a half a mile. It doesn't seem that long when you say it. Go walk a half a mile. Be st stranded in the air. It's pretty, pretty long. And we go 50 miles an hour. OK, I'm going to do this. So they go in, they buckle me in, I'm sitting there, I'm all strapped, I'm checking every safety thing, making sure, I'm looking at the kids, I'm looking at Shiloh, everybody's buckled in, and they have this wall in front of you so you can't go forward, because as soon as they open that door, you're out. There's no stopping you, so you're leaning against it. So three, two, one, push, open it up, we take off. My initial reaction is to scream, I'm sorry, I'm secure enough, I was gonna scream, I was scared. But then I said, wait a second, this isn't that bad. It's actually kind of fun. It's a great view from up here. I'm pretty secure. This is nice. I like this. So I had the experience. I enjoyed the experience. But my perspective going into this experience robbed me of my thought life. It robbed me of probably hours of stressing and worrying about something that I eventually did and enjoyed. Because I was looking through the wrong lens. I was looking through the lens of fear and doubt, not of faith and victory. Highly, highly recommend it. It was fun. But church, know your circumstances are not forever. They can change in an instant. Just like that. Circumstances, when you're surrounded by them, as humans, and maybe it's just me, when you're overwhelmed with your circumstances, it's hard to focus on anything else. You're right there in the mix. You can't see anything outside of the realm of your circumstances. But I want to remind you, it doesn't rain forever. It doesn't snow forever. It's not 100 degrees forever. In the darkest part of night, the following morning, the sun is going to rise. Circumstances change. Find your strength in whose power is in you, not in the circumstances that are around you. The 4th of July, I was with some of you on the 4th of July. It was a great day. 
beautiful sunny day. Hot, very hot. Thank God for AC. I haven't said that yet, but thank God for him. Super hot. Storms roll in. Everybody out of the pool. Thunderstorms come in. Ten minutes later, it's beautiful sunny again. Everything changed within 15, 20 minutes. I want to challenge you. Check your perspective. Are you focusing on the problem? Or are you focusing on the God that can solve your problem? We're going to look at Mark 4, 35 to 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. How many of us know that when trials and tribulations come up against us or we're facing storm in life, it usually, usually comes as a bit of a surprise. You're walking along, everything seems to be going well, and all of a sudden a storm pops up. When Jesus and the disciples got in the boat, it was calm. The storm came out of nowhere. Most of us, I would think, wouldn't willingly just walk straight into the middle of the storm. You're walking when everything's going well. But you need to be prepared when the storm comes up against you. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. His disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Put a little voice inflection there because in my mind, that's how they said it. You got you to gotta love the disciples. They were real. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you still afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Which leads me to my second point. Know whose team you are on. And I'm going to say it again, because if you mix those words around, which I did the first time, it says something completely different. Know whose team you are on. Originally, I wrote, know who's on my team, because we... I'm going to use myself, tend to try to do things our own strength. We tend to try to go at it alone. I'm going to use another sports analogy. I'm the starting pitcher. I get in there. It's the top of the third. Bases are loaded. I'm down 8-1, no outs, and I call Jesus in from the bullpen. I should have just had him start the game. He's better than I am. No matter how good I am, he's better. But we send sometimes, and I do it, don't include him in the little things. Don't include him in the, the mundane, everyday life stuff. He wants us to go at it in his strength, not ours. If we look at 1 Corinthians 1, 24 to 25, but to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. No matter how good we are at something, no matter how great we think we are or others think that we are, God's strength is still better. We're human. All of us make mistakes. We're not perfect, but God is perfect, and his strength is more powerful than we could ever imagine. My favorite Bible verse, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Now, this is an if-then statement. This isn't really two things here. It's just if you do one, then this will happen. So if you trust in the Lord within all your heart, it's impossible to lean on your own understanding. So you just got to do the first part. And I know it's hard. Surrendering is hard. But once you do it, life becomes a whole lot easier because you're not going at it in your own strength. I mean, I've mentioned this before on Youth Sundays and other times that I've been up here and I shared, but Peter, Peter gets a bum rap. I feel bad for Peter. He's the only one that got out of the boat. Nobody else got out of the boat. He was a fisherman. He knew he couldn't walk on water. We, he knew that. He's been around water his whole life. But yet, when his eyes were focused on Jesus and Jesus called him, he stepped out of the boat and walked on water. He was able to do things through Jesus' strength that he could not do in his own. He was able to walk on water when his eyes were on Jesus. Once his eyes became off Jesus, he sank. He's not able to do it in his own strength. This is hard for us. It's hard for us to trust in the Lord with all our heart and not lean on our own understanding. 
And I would just say, for me, why is it hard? Because I want to know why. It's just my personality. It's most of our personalities. In the business world, there's a lot of time. You go to some TED Talks, they're going to talk about the why behind things, and everybody needs to know the why we're going to do this. And I hear from my kids, Daddy, why do I need to eat broccoli? Why do I need to put my phone down? Why do I need to go to bed? It's only 12 o'clock. I've only been playing Fortnite for six hours. Because I'm old and I'm tired and I got to work in the morning. That's why you need to go to bed. But sometimes God says, just trust me. He says, trust me. And you don't know why until you're through the situation. And I'm going to share a story of my Auntie Kathy. Some of you may know her. She lives out in Arizona. So she had open heart surgery back in 2005. And recently she needs to go in for a valve replacement. So her doctor gave her two names of surgeons to reach out to and schedule consultations with. Now she went to the first one. She liked them. Guy looked at all of her charts, said, okay, you've had surgery before, you are high risk, but I think we can do this. So let's move forward. We're going to schedule it for June 8th. So there's actually a date that was scheduled for the surgery. It was June 8th. Mid-May, she starts calling the doctor's office. Hey, I haven't heard from you. Don't we need some prep? Don't I need to come in? I don't really know timing. Don't we need to do some pre-operation prep, what do I need to do for this? Last time I had to do some things. She called, left that message. Called again, and again, and again. Nobody's returning the phone calls. Finally, she calls and somebody answers. Lady puts her on hold, goes, speaks to the surgeon. She picks up, tells my aunt, yeah, sorry, we're not gonna do the surgery. What? The surgery's in two weeks now. You told me I've been prepared for this. Why aren't we gonna do it? It's like, well, you're, you're high risk. She's like, well, you knew I was high risk. You told me I was high risk. You're the one that told me I was high risk. And you said you were going to do it. And now you're not. So no, the doctor decided he doesn't want to do it. Doesn't make a lot of sense. No new information. Nothing has changed. Not me. Or maybe this is just me. I'd have been ticked off. I'd have been annoyed. I'd have been frustrated. I'd be like, what is this? This doesn't make any sense. I need this surgery. This person says I'm going to give me this. They're going to give me the surgery. And then they walk away. But... Got to love it when there's a but. But there was another doctor, another surgeon that she hadn't met with yet. Now, this one was a little different. She didn't go to this one because she really liked the first one. She goes to this one. Now, this surgeon, he didn't specialize just in hearts. He specialized in hearts and lungs. He specialized in heart transplants and lung transplants. All over the world, this guy was renowned. Does all types of these crazy complex surgeries. So she goes, meets, consultation. Yeah, we can do the surgery. Okay, so fast forward. We're three weeks from June 8th. So we're beginning of July, end of June, somewhere around there. She goes in to have the surgery. Now it's a long surgery. It's an eight-hour surgery here on the table. It's a super long time. And I'll remind you, this guy specializes in hearts and lungs. Because then when they opened my aunt up, her lung was attached to her heart. That's a big deal. I don't know if it is, but to me it sounds like it's a big deal because that's not supposed to happen. So she went with the first doctor, the cardiologist only, the heart surgeon. I don't know if he would have known what to do. He might have just stitched her back up. I don't know. But this doctor, he knew exactly what to do. It was so matter of fact, he went in, cut it away, went through with the surgery. He comes out after the end of the surgery and tells my cousin, your mom's doing fine. Oh, oh and by the way, her heart was attached, her lung was attached to her heart and I had to cut that away. Not a big deal. Just very matter of fact, like it was nothing. The other surgeon didn't know that. This surgeon didn't know that until he opened her up. But you know who knew it? God knew it. And that's why he shut that door. I'm a firm believer that my aunt and the success of this surgery, God's hand was in it. He changed it even though the plans were already set to be done. And this surgeon, my aunt was able to have the right surgery with the right surgeon. She's home now, she's resting, she's recovering fine. Thank you, Jesus, because to my mind, that's a big deal. But God saw the beginning from the end. God didn't just let us move forward and settle for good when God has the best for us. Sometimes the score doesn't look good. I coach basketball. Sometimes you're down 20 points at the half. And you're like, what are we going to do? Things just aren't working. The scoreboard is telling a story. But I want to encourage you. 
So it's my third point. Don't give up. No, I'm sorry, Peter. I'm sorry, Melissa. I am not a New England Patriots fan. I don't like them. I am sorry. I am a New York Giants fan. I know I mentioned Peter and Melissa. They're here from Jersey. Diehard Patriots fans. We go back and forth and we banter all the time. I don't like them. I'm not a Patriots fan, but I have to respect them. I have to. Two Super Bowls ago, they were getting absolutely destroyed. Absolutely, absolutely crushed at halftime. I was ready to switch to Netflix and start binge watching something else. I'm like, these commercials are terrible. This isn't even in a game. I don't even watch it anymore. Because I thought the game was over, and so did the majority of the world, except for the folks that were in the locker room and the coaches who coached the team, because they knew that they can win. They believed in themselves. They knew no matter what, we still got two quarters to play. The scoreboard may show that we're down, but the game isn't over. It's only halfway. They may have beat us in the first half, but we're going to beat them in the second half. It doesn't matter what the score at halftime is. It matters what the score at the end of the game is. And they did. They came back, and they won the game. They believed in themselves, and that's how we need to be as Christians. We might be down. It might seem like it's over, but we need to press on. God's timing isn't always our timing, but God's timing is always right. For me, I tend to be a little, I don't want to say impatient. God's been working with me on that. But I like things fast. I'm from New England. I'm a Northeasterner. I'm just wired that way. We, everything we want is fast. Fast food, fast cars, no lines. God forbid I sit on hold when I call the cable company or my cell phone. I don't like that. I just, it's just how we're wired. We want to be taken care of quickly. But I want to encourage you, don't give up. Press on. My favorite Bible story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Absolutely love it. So we're going to look at that starting in Daniel 3. And I'll set the backstage here. Now, so King Nebuchadnezzar, he created an image of gold, or they created an image of gold. And the decree was put out. Everybody needed to bow down and worship this image. And if you don't, you're going to get thrown into a fiery furnace. Not great for motivating people. It's really not leading with the carrot, more leading with the stick on this one. So look in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods, or worship the image of gold you have set up. They don't give up. They press on. They stand firm. And they're really in a life or death situation right now. It's either bow down and worship this image of gold or get thrown into the fire. Sometimes we may have to make tough decisions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't falter. They didn't question well, what do I really believe? Do I really believe this or do I not? They knew. They knew what they believed. They know who they believed. And no matter what the consequences or what the outcome was, they were not going to falter. It's important to know what we believe and why we believe it. Because we live in a world where everybody wants to tell us what we believe, what we like, what we don't like, what to eat, what to wear, what clothes to buy, what car to drive. And if you don't know, you could ask Siri, you can ask Alexa, and I don't think this crowd's going to get it, but you could ask Jeeves, but he's not around anymore because that's where it all started way back when. Poor Jeeves. But everybody wants to tell you, and if you don't know, you'll believe almost anything. We need to be prepared. We need to know what we believe before the trial comes. No matter what came against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, no matter how big or how severe, they knew what they believed in. So they're thrown into the furnace, and we're going to continue in verse 22. <coughs> the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. So Nebuchadnezzar was so ticked off at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they stood firm in what they believed that he turned the furnace up seven times hotter than what it normally should, that the guards that were holding Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego burned up. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
they're thrown in the fire. King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Church, I don't know what you're going through. We all go through things. Life isn't easy. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fire, but they weren't there alone, and you're not there alone. Church, this isn't a fight that we have to fight by ourselves. We were given the Holy Spirit to comfort us when we're going through difficult situations, but there's also power in the Holy Spirit to get us through those situations and be victorious on the other side. So what happens next? King Nebuchadnezzar issued a decree that no one could speak against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I want to paraphrase this, but the decree was that anybody that speaks against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would be cut up into lots of pieces and their houses destroyed. So it was a pretty serious decree that nobody would come be able to speak against our almighty God. But walk with me a step backwards. We talked about circumstances before. How quickly did the circumstances here change? King Nebuchadnezzar was angry. He threw him in the fire. He was against the Almighty God. Fast forward five minutes. He's issuing a decree that nobody could speak against him. And if they were, bad things were going to happen. And he promoted Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Circumstances change quickly. What do you think the message was for the people that were sitting around watching this? Because I'm sure this was a spectacle. Throwing people in the fire. I mean, most of us would go, hey, what's going on over there? Think of the testimony for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Think of what that says about the Almighty God. Again, we know a lot of people. Some people don't read the Bible, will never step foot in the church. Our actions and what we do is the only Bible they're ever going to read. It's a testimony. We're an example. We're supposed to live in this world as light. And God, I, I don't encourage you this morning. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it would have been really easy if here's the fire. And God, I trusted you to hear. We're good. But you get it, right? They're going to throw me in the fire. What do you want me to do? What do you expect me to do? But God honors obedience over sacrifice. And sometimes we have to trust him through the fire, not just to the fire. I'll say that again. Sometimes we need to trust him through the fire, not just to the fire. And it's not easy. Church, you're not alone in this. God will show up. My own personal life, sometimes I've had to take another lap, the proverbial lap, because I've trusted right up to the victory. The victory's right there. But I let fear and doubt come in. I look through the wrong lens, and I got to take another lap. God wants our obedience. The odds were against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But church, we serve the almighty God. And I want to encourage you. I've seen it today. We serve a God that still heal, heals. He still restores Nothing is impossible. He still talks to us. And again, I bring it back to the decision they made on the Haiti. That is, nobody saw that coming. And if you looked at the circumstances in the flesh, they would have just went. But nothing's impossible for God. And this brings me to my last point. As I sneak a sip of water. Know the victory is already yours. Maybe it's just me, but sometimes I get discouraged when I put the TV on. I put the news on. The news is very seldom on in my house. But I see what's going on in the world with politics, with riots, with all types of crazies, and you get discouraged. And it brings you down. It becomes depressing. Because we live in an imperfect world. And as Christians, we have a real enemy. And it's not the cute little cartoon character with a fork and pointy ears and red. We have an enemy. And his job description is to steal, kill, and destroy. Church, he knows he already lost. But what he's trying to do is convince you otherwise. He's trying to convince you that he wins. Because if we know he already lost, why do we listen to him? But we do it. He tells, if he tells us long enough, maybe we'll believe. Christian, if I tell you long enough this is a bottle of cream soda, as opposed to a delicious bottle of Kirkland spring water, if I sit here for a half hour and just whisper in your ear, sooner or later, you just might believe it. You just may stop and be like, well, I guess he's right. Because persistent. He's trying to convince us that he wins, and he doesn't. We are victorious. 1 John 5, 4. 
For every child of God defeats the ev this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. Deuteronomy 20, verse 4. For the Lord your God is the one who give, goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. Church, we're not alone in this. As believers, we fight from a position of strength. We have the high ground. We don't need to go run and hide in the bunker. We are victorious through Christ Jesus. We fight from victory. We are fighting from a position of victory, not for victory. The victory is already ours. And knowing that makes the fight easier. I'm not saying it's easy because it's not. But knowing the victory is already yours is important. Romans 8, 37 to 39. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Church, champions act like champions before they're champions. When David stepped out on the battlefield against Goliath, he was already victorious in his mind. He had the victory mindset. That was his perspective. It's all about how we approach things. God promises, and it's important to know the promises of God, because God promises to make you the head and not the tail. He promises to give you the upper hand in every situation. He promises to give you hope in a future. But the enemy is going to come in and try to blur that and discourage you. It's important to know this because everybody wants to get to the top of the mountain. Everybody wants to get to the top of the mountain. Besides me, anybody ever climb Mount Everest? Just curious, throw a hand. No? Just making sure you're awake. You know, it's late in the afternoon. We're going into lunchtime. I, too, have not climbed Mount Everest. But it's the top of a mountain. And I've been in church for 30-plus years. And you hear a lot about mountaintops and the valley. Lots of songs, lots of hymns, lots of things, lots of sermons. And everybody's fighting to get to the top of that mountain. But do you know what grows on top of a mountain? Nothing. Nothing's on the top of a mountain. It's barren for the most part. But everybody wants to get there. As Christians, we're going to go through the valley. And you know what's in the valley? Life. A river gardens, trees, a beautiful church, a village. It's bustling with life, but everybody's rushing through the valley because they want to get to the mountaintop. We grow in the valley. That's where things grow. I'm going to share a story. It's about 25 years ago, we were in Switzerland, and we were, uh, we were up in the Swiss Alps. And it was beautiful. Switzerland, if you've never been, I'd love to get back there, but it's beautiful. So we were up on the top of the mountain. And we got up there and we're looking around. And we see this beautiful lake. We see this church. We see this quaint little town. And everything looks wonderful. But do you know what I was looking at? You know what that was? That was where I just was. I drove through that town to get to the top of the mountain. I drove by that church. But what was different? My perspective was different. From where I was... I appreciated it more. And as we're going through the valley, as we're going through difficult times, you're going to come out the other side much stronger than when you came in. Appreciate what you're going through. Again, God wants obedience, not just to the fire, but through it. Gold is refined in the fire. We grow in the valley. I want to encourage you this morning that no matter what you're going through, God is there with you. Check the perspective. Sometimes life's a fight. And I want to close with this. What's your perspective? Are you looking through the lens of doubt and fear? Or are you looking through the lens of faith and victory? Know whose team you are on. Know whose team you are on. Don't give up. No matter what the scoreboard says, don't give up. Game's not over at halftime. It's not how you start the race. It's how you finish. That's what's important. In church, the victory is already yours through Christ Jesus, through nothing that we have done. By grace, the victory is ours through Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe this is the first time you've been to church. Maybe you happened to drive by and heard we have good coffee in the back and you wanted to pop in and say hello. 
But all of what we covered this morning is important, but not nearly as important as making the decision to have Jesus as Lord of your life. Now, I know there might be a tugging on your heart, and if there is, I'd ask you to be obedient to it. Now we just have everybody to bow their head, close their eyes, and if you feel that stirring in their voice, I'd ask you to say this prayer in your heart. And what it is, is it's inviting Jesus into your heart. It's a relationship with God. It's surrendering to him. It's putting him front and center. So dear God, we love you. Lord, we thank you that you died on the cross for us. Lord, I acknowledge that we're sinners. I invite you into our, my heart, Lord, and I choose to live my life for you. And I surrender to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Arnold went over this before, but the connection card that we all got, if that was the first time that you said that, um, I'd ask that you would fill this out, drop it in the offering plate as it comes by. And why? Because we want to pray for you. Because we know this is a fight in church. You're not in this alone. Lord, if you, look ar- if you look around here, you're in a room of fellow believers who love you and care about you and want to pray for you. So I'd ask you to drop that in the offering basket as it comes along. As the ushers come forward and we pray for the tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we serve a a risen God, the almighty God, the name of of all names, Lord. And Lord, as we give back to you from what you so richly given us, we pray, Lord, that you would bless it, you would multiply it, use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. We ask that you would bless the giver that they may give again, and all that we do be glorified to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You unravel me with a melody, but you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave. Jesus, you worship your God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I am surrounded by the arms of the Father. songs of 
so much for coming today. If you need prayer for anything at all, please come up front. We'd love to stand with you. And if not, you guys have a blessed week, all right? <laughs>